sorry. So anyway, back to Grandpa Hart and his family. They came from Maine and they were, what are they called? It was during the time of the American uh, Revolution. They were, huh, now that term just left me. They wanted to remain loyal to the king. United Empire Loyalists, that's what they were. And of course, um, they weren't popular. And so they, the family that wanted to remain loyal to the king of England, they immigrated to New Brunswick. And there are a group of, of ancestors that are there to this day um, uh, that, um, that are still there. But Grandpa Hart, he said to heck with it because uh, the economic situation in those days was terrible. And so they moved out, he moved out west. And somehow he and Grandma Hart, Grandma Ferguson got, got together. My, my grandmother, Granny, Granny Hart, I'll call her. But um, they were both quite young and they got married and they decided to go homesteading and they um they got a homestead and they arrived on that homestead in 1917 by horse-drawn carriage with all their possessions on it i don't know much about how they set everything up i'm sure it was a real tough situation but um um, between grandma and grandpa, they, they, they made a pretty good go of it. Grandpa was a machinist and he was um, politically active and he wasn't a horseman and he had a terrible temper. And, and this was way before there were motorized vehicles. And so... <clears throat> They probably had a, 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 a team, two horses, to pull the wagon out to the homestead. So at some point, um, they needed more horses. They needed a four-horse hitch. And so Grandpa, being the guy, he went and found himself a four-horse hitch. And there was one that was um, a normal, well-behaved, broke horse. Another one had indigestion all the time. I'm not sure how Granny figured that out, but she did. And so every time this horse ate grain, it would get a bellyache. So she, they had a barn by this time, so she would take a bottle and uh, throw a rope over a beam in the barn and pull the horse's head up and pour a bottle of... Um, baking soda water down this horse's gullet and um, fix its uh, bellyache. It probably had an ulcer, truth of the matter, but in any case, um, that's how she dealt with it. And the horse went fine. And, um, and then the third horse was a kicker. And um, one day, Grandpa came in out of doing field work with his four-horse hitch, <clears throat> and Grandma was helping him unhook, <clears throat> helping him unhook the team, and this kicker kicked Granny Hart pretty hard. And um, Grandpa, like I say, had a terrible temper, and uh, so he went out after they got the horses put away. He got himself a chunk of steel rod, iron rod, was probably for digging post holes with. And um, um, he took the horse out in the yard and um, <clears throat> he hit her between the eyes, flat on to her face, and he had every intention of killing the horse. And, and he dropped her dead in the yard. And so they, he went in to have dinner and when he was finished eating, he says, well, I better go out and <clears throat> dig a hole and drag that horse's carcass into it and bury her. And, uh, but when he got out in the yard, she, it was standing up. She was a little unsteady on her feet, but Grandma said she never kicked again. 
So that was Grandpa's first um, four horse hitch. Um, he also, when when you're out in the bald headed prairies and you're, and it doesn't matter if you're working a team of horses or you've got big fancy modern tractors, there's always going to be potholes. And so I guess he was out plowing and he was um, going to plant a hay field or a grain field. And and because he wanted every square foot he could get, he got too close to one of those potholes. And this one horse he had liked to lay down in harness <clears throat> when it got muddy. And this horse laid down in that mud pot um, and, and he couldn't get her up. And so grandma could hear him from the house. He, he wasn't too far away. And he was cursing and swearing and yelling. And she went out. And what he was doing was, because this horse had laid down flat in the, this mud hole, and he was walking on top of the horse, back and forth, back and forth, cursing and swearing. And he was walking that horse into the mud. <laughs> he had totally lost his brain. I don't know how Granny got the horse up. I have no idea. But she got him up and off they went again. Um, but Grandpa did have a terrible, terrible temper. Terrible temper. So somewhere along the line, um, they had their kids. Um, the first one was a son, and he was a horseman. I remember Stanley well. He died maybe 20 years ago. He actually was a pickup man in the Calgary Stampede, which was going at that time. Would have been very early days of the Calgary Stampede. And um, um, somewhere along the line, they got a tractor. They also had, um, I'm not sure what kind of vehicle they had to go to town, so Granny didn't have to drive the team and buggy on the, that she had her light driving team hooked up to what was called a buckboard. I finally remembered the name of that wagon. And um, 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 where was I going with this? Um, but Grandpa was known for having a terrible temper, an absolutely terrible temper. But by now, we're talking the Second World War had come along. But Grandpa was an expert machinist, and he was one of those that didn't get, um, he didn't volunteer to go overseas, and he wasn't drafted because he had an essential service um, of being a machinist. And in Calgary, there was a very large steam locomotive repair shop. And at the beginning of the war, they turned that huge machine shop into a gun factory. And we're talking the big guns that were on the um, battleships. And um, that's where they built a lot of those big guns. So when they made the decision to move to Calgary, they kept the farm. The oldest son ran the farm. They went uh, in and bought a, a, a house that had several bedrooms in it. And Granny started a boarding house so that people, men that were working in this shop, could come and have room and board with her. And that's how mom and dad met. So my dad was an amazing machinist. And um, he came to board with, with mom and grandma, but also my mom was with them. And mom got a job, um, I think she was a secretary or she had a job in Calgary as well. So um, all to do with the war effort. And um, that's, as I say, that's where mom and dad met. 
and <clears throat> shortly after the war they were married and and um mom didn't go back to the farm with grandma and grandpa dad actually got a job at the crow's nest pass um um power plant which has been shut down ever since i can remember um so he worked there as a machinist and um, repairing and working with all the big um, hydro stuff that was there on Crow's Nest Lake. And um, right after the war, there was no um, fresh fruits and vegetables, nothing like that. I need to back up a little bit. Um, when I was born, they were still in Calgary. Um, it was at the end of the war, I need to tell a couple of stories about my dad. I got ahead of myself. Forgive me. I'm not 100% real well here. Anyway, um, what happened was when I was born, mom didn't have any breast milk. And the only kind of milk they could get was canned milk. And I could not digest canned milk. So um, by the time I was three months old, I weighed less than I did at birth. And um, the doctor didn't have, he, he was out of options and um, they thought they were going to lose me. And so Granny said, um, the kid's dying anyway. She said, would you let me try something? And mom says, what have we got to lose? So, like, of course. So Granny went to the local creamery and she said, could you please, if you have a supplier that has a Jersey cow, could you please get me some straight, unpasteurized, un unprocessed Jersey milk? And so they were very obliging and, and did that. And the first time they fed me on whole Jersey milk, um, because what would happen before is anything they fed me, because I was starving to death, I would, within a few minutes, I'd bring it all up. So this Jersey milk, I downed it and I fell asleep and mom was so cute. I Apparently I slept for 10 hours and she said, I thought you had died. She said, I had to wake you up to prove to myself you were still alive. So I have a particular fondness for Jersey cows and, um, and it's because of that. So Granny Hart and some beautiful little Jersey cow is what saved my life. So, but then um, I'll tell you a story about my dad. My dad loved guns and he it didn't matter if it was a, a little handgun or big guns and so the British Royal Navy because now we're talking the British Navy was building battleships because they knew the Battle of Britain was going to happen and they had um, draftsmen that were drawing up these plans to build these big, huge guns to go on the battleships, bigger than they'd ever built before. But they couldn't get them to fire properly. And so the British Admiralty put out uh, a request to the Commonwealth to see if there was any of the gun shops that could figure out how to get this firing mechanism to work on these big um, uh, uh, guns to go on the battleships. So my grandfather, who was a foreman at that shop, went to dad and said, do you think you could get this sorted out? And dad says, I tell you what, he said, if you give me the bits and pieces, 
and leave me alone. Don't try to tell me how to, how to do my job. He said, just give it to me and leave me alone and let me do it. And they did because they were pretty desperate. So um, dad figured it out. The guns um, worked. They built a whole raft of them. And if you remember the Johnny Horton song about the battle between the the Bismarck and the, what was the other boat ship's name? Um, I can't think at the moment. I'm not feeling all that well. I'm either hot or cold or whatever. Never mind. Um, so anyway, um, after that battle of the North Pacific between the Germans and the, and the British fleet, which the British won because of Dad's figuring out this this problem with the firing mechanism on these big uh, cannons. Um, the one of the top British admirals wanted to meet my dad, and um, Dad couldn't do that. He he disappeared and they had this big ceremony and they had a big presentation and um, of, of course grandpa hart couldn't find dad and finally after the whole thing was over and the uh, visitors had left um um dad was discovered underneath one of these big huge um, milling machines uh, because it needed to be cleaned out so he was cleaning it out he was hiding because he couldn't admit that he had done something so important somewhere along the line the draftsman that had come with the group that had um, come to do this this presentation uh, was able to meet my dad and my dad was probably the only white you could see on him because he was covered with grease and crud from being under this machine. Um, the the draftsman said, oh, "How did you figure it out?" He said, I, "I'm I'm I'm just totally stumped by it." And and so Dad told him and showed him what he had done. And the guy said that can't be right. He said, I was very careful and I've got this all figured out on the slide rule. He said, I just couldn't figure it out. And so the guy got his slide rule out of his pocket and he started measuring what dad had done and what he had done. And he stopped and he looked at my dad and he said, you know, he said, I made a mistake with my slide rule. He said, you figured it out. He said, I couldn't figure it out. So that was my dad. That was my dad. I'll talk a few other things about my dad. I remember <clears throat> that first tractor that Grandma and Grandpa Hart got. It was um, it was steel wheeled, and it was a big, heavy, nasty thing to operate. And I was about four or five, and Dad was always very willing to let me. Um, ride with him whether it was in the car or if it was on the tractor and um, he was showing me how to operate it and he um, he had he was using a rod reader or a, a, a disc or something anyway he got a rock dug up <clears throat> and we needed to get the outfit stopped and so he said that I could stand on the clutch but I could stand on that clutch with both feet. I maybe weighed, I don't know, 40 pounds, maybe. I couldn't, I couldn't depress that, so he had to lift me off and push the clutch in so he could get everything stopped. Um, I also remember standing between his legs and him driving very slowly and allowing me to steer with our Franklin. I think it was a 1928 Franklin, and um, the steering wheel on those big vehicles is enormous, um, more like what you'd see on a big long haul truck today. Anyway, I'm getting tired, 
So I will download these and um, yeah, hopefully I'm feeling up to doing this uh, again pretty soon. Thank you. Bye.